Uh, my name is Nathan Swearingen. I am a therapist from the Guidance Center. We are a county contract children's mental health agency. Um, we are in lots of schools in Long Beach. I don't think we're here. You guys have a different agency. Um, but basically, that's what we do. I've been a school-based clinician for uh, maybe 11 or 12 years, uh, working with hundreds of different children. And over my experience and, and my studies and uh, you know, supervision and research, I, I came to understand that all of the problems that these children were being referred to me to fix, uh, whether it be emotional problems, uh, behavioral problems, learning difficulties, um, they were almost always related to trauma. And we're going to define that because trauma is a very, uh, it's a very narrowly defined term traditionally, but we're going to kind of broaden that. So if you're uncomfortable with that, it's just semantics. We can call it um, excessive stress, whatever you want to call it. But um, basically, as a clinician, I, um, I came to realize this. And with, when working with the schools, the most important thing is helping the teachers and helping the parents understand why these kids are acting the way they're acting, to really understand what's driving the behavior rather than just trying to control the behavior itself. We need to focus on the, the real problem, not the symptom of the problem. So uh, that led me to um, this past year, I cut back as a part-time clinician in my other time was spent at Beach High School, which is an alternative education high school here in Long Beach um, for the at-risk uh, youth, um, helping Beach High School become trauma-informed, helping the teachers and staff understand why these kids are acting this way. Um, and being a consultant and a model um, at that high school, and it's gone really, really well with some quite tremendous uh, results, decreases in uh, suspension, increases in attendance, less fights, um, I mean, it's not a miracle, but it's, it's some really good progress. Uh, the staff over there is amazing. They already have some great um, programs in place, safe and civil, restorative justice, and all these things together, just understanding basically why these kids are struggling so much. And so, let's get into it. Understanding what trauma is. So, trauma is any experience that overwhelms us, leaving us altered and disconnected from our bodies. Okay, so. It's about an inability to cope. It's about feeling helpless and hopeless. It, trauma is not in the event itself. Trauma is in the nervous system. So when most people think of trauma, they think of physical abuse, sexual abuse, um, uh, combat uh, trauma, um, natural disasters. All those things are traumatic. Those things are, are scary things. And when people think of trauma, especially when you open up the, the DSM, which is the Diagnostic and Statistical Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, you know, trauma is defined as oh, intrusive thoughts or flashbacks or um, you know, uh, difficulty concentrating on things. Those things are symptoms of the trauma. That's not what trauma is. Trauma is the one criteria that the DSM gets right, which is a change to your nervous system. So trauma isn't psychological, it's physiological. And it's not just narrowed to super scary stuff, which we'll learn. Those things are traumatic, but trauma lies on a spectrum. It's not an all or nothing type thing, okay? So the best way that I've seen it put is, trauma creates a distorted smoke detector. The, the smoke detector, the areas of your brain that are responsible for perceiving threat, the areas in your brain that are responsible for taking in sensory stimuli, you know, sight, taste, touch, um, uh, social relationships, uh, tone of voice, all those things, you know, lots of different things. Those areas in the brain are physiologically changed. They're literally changed. It's not about your thoughts. It's not about your perception. It's about look under an MRI. They're physiologically changed to have a, a distorted perception of reality. And having a distorted perception of reality is having a distorted threat response. And we'll talk about what threat response looks like. So the body continues to fight the unseen enemy, uh, Bessel van der Kolk, world-renowned trauma expert. Um, so yeah, basically the thermostat is out of balance, the, the smoke detector is out of balance. So it's a physical changes to the stress response. It's not a psychological phenomenon. Psychological symptoms like fear and worry and stuff, those are symptoms, that's not the trauma. So it's a huge distinction. And I'm gonna go really fast, I apologize because I wanna have um, time for questions and vignettes. I think those are the most, um, important and helpful things for you guys. Okay, now what about this child? Or 
Uh, can you give me an example of this? So um, I will have, uh, I emailed the slides to Tracy so she can um, uh, print them up for you guys. So I apologize if I'm going fast. It's just a lot of information um, in, in one hour. Okay, so obvious examples of trauma. Don't need to go over these. These are things that could be traumatic, okay? Obvious. Overlooked examples of trauma. And I want to preface this with a disclaimer. Most of us have had these certain things. That doesn't mean, oh gosh, Nathan thinks everything that happens to you is trauma, and Nathan thinks that if, if this happened to me, he thinks my nervous system is messed up and I'm, uh, you know, have problems. That's, that's not the case. These are things that could be traumatic. These are things that could be perceived by your nervous system and by your, your developing brain as um, overwhelmingly stressful. And depending on the amount of supports that you have, depending on the amount of reparative um, resources, which is, for the most part, loving, safe relationships, um, you know, safe community, and even you know, mental health care, these things, you know, a handful of these things, if they happen to you, you're going to be just fine. So I just wanted to preface that. Okay, so exposure to verbal, emotional, domestic violence. This is by far the biggest one. Most of my clients have not been physically abused or sexually abused. A lot of them have, but most of the traumatized kids is exposure to domestic violence. We're gonna get into it later, but the thought of they're too young to remember, they don't know, uh, they're too young to understand, uh, they won't remember, that is absolutely untrue. That's not how the nervous system works. We'll talk about that soon. Uh, in utero DV, oh my gosh, if I had more time, I'd give you examples of clients showing proof that their nervous system remembers even when they were in utero. Uh, premature birth, lack of neonatal, neonatal bonding, being born and poked and prodded with needles, yeah, they're trying to save the child's life or you know, maybe the mother's life, but that's not how it's supposed to be. That's incredibly stressful for a brand new nervous system. Divorce can be incredibly stressful on kids, uh, especially if it isn't handled well. If the parents are blaming the kids or if the kid blames themselves, that can be incredibly emotionally stressful. Adoption foster care. If you have kids in foster care, they've been traumatized. There's, there's, there's no kid in foster care that has not been traumatized. Parent substance abuse. This one is a big one. Um, caregiver abandonment, incarceration, deportation. Happens all the time in this population here in Long Beach. More medical dental procedures. Um, children, they're too young to understand. They won't remember. Let's just hold them down and strap them down and do these incredibly invasive things. That's incredibly, incredibly traumatic. Uh, poverty or neighborhood violence, bullying, frequent move, I don't need to go into all this. Um, racism, lack of attunement, this one's a big one. So you can have a, a child that has not been overtly abused or overtly treated poorly. It's a loving parent. Um, there's no domestic violence, but their social situation, their, their poverty or their stress level or the parent's depression or the parent's anxiety or the parent's isolation, lack of social support. You know, the rest of their families in Mexico or uh, back east and they're alone and they're raising four or five kids and you know, the dad up and left. And the mom loves their kids so much, but there's just, you know, God love her, it's not her fault. There's not enough attunement to, to, to help that nervous system develop appropriately. So that's, that's a, a very concrete example of trauma isn't just horrible things that happens to you. It's uh, a developing nervous system not receiving the adequate uh, interactions that it needs. And I think that's the next slide. So healthy brain circuit development needs non-stressed, emotionally available, constantly available parenting caregiver. That's, that's a lot of pressure on us. Nobody's perfect. Um, I mean, I'm not saying if you have a bad day and you're not there for your kid every once in a while, you know, you're just like, oh, leave me alone, I gotta watch TV or zone out. You're not gonna traumatize your kid, but it's, it's a matter of uh, frequency and intensity. So I think this quote is extremely accurate. Trauma isn't just when bad things happen, but it's when good things don't happen. There's certain developmental things that need to happen. You need to gaze at your child when you're holding them. You need to smile, you need to, feel joy, you need to feel those love hormones when you're holding a child, not just sit there stressed out, you know, nursing your baby. If that's, I mean, if you do that every once in a while, that's fine. But if that's how the whole development is, you're not an abusive mother, but that is not, that's, that's when good things don't happen. Those things need to happen. Okay, neuroscience really quick. Actually, we're gonna have a few slides on this, but, um, you don't need to understand the, the complexities of the brain, just understand it conceptually. Okay. The brain is a historical organ. 
it becomes what it has been exposed to, okay? So nurture versus nature, throw a lot of the nature out the window. Of course there are some things, developmental delays, uh, you know, mental retardation, chromosomal abnormalities, birth defects, stuff like that. That, of course, is nurture. But as far as, oh, it's genetic, it runs in my family, there's genetic predispositions, but actually with epigenetics, the environment turns on and off gene expression, turns on and off. So we're literally shaped by what we have been exposed to, okay? So the brain is use dependent. Here's some concrete examples. Um, there's different areas of the brain. The brain isn't just a brain. There's a vision center of the brain. There's an auditory center of the brain. There's a speech and language center of the brain. There is a, an area of the brain for recognizing social cues. There is an area of the brain for um, emotional regulation. There's an area of the brain for regulating uh, heart rate, stuff like this. Also, I mean, dozens and dozens of different areas of the brain. They need to be used to develop. They're use dependent. It's dependent on their use. So uh, I'll just take one, language. If you are born in Europe and you are exposed to five or six different languages from birth, you will quite easily learn five or six different languages. The language center of your brain will look very different from the language center of your brain that was only provided one language. And to take that to an extreme, if a child is emotionally neglected, and only spoken to you know, a fraction of the amount of words or caring interactions um, that another child is, their language center of the brain is literally gonna be compromised. When they get up to kindergarten, if they've only had 10 or 20% of what's required for a normal five or six year old, meaning they've only had the, the number of words spoken to them like a two year old, guess what? They're gonna learn like a two year old. They're not gonna be able to learn language. That doesn't mean that they're retarded. That doesn't mean they were born that way. It means that they, that area of the brain was not uh, provided adequate stimulation. It's not too late, you can repair it, but you're playing catch up. The same thing has to do with empathy, uh, emotional regulation, your ability to love, uh, your ability to problem solve. So think of the example of, of language, of learning five languages versus learning one. The same thing is with empathy. You can't have empathy if you are not empathized with. If you only have, let's say by the time you're 15 years old, you should have 100,000 ex arbitrary uh, experiences of someone giving you empathy. Someone, oh, are you okay? Let me help you through this, right? You'll have quote unquote normal empathy when you're that age. But if you've only had 500 or 1,000, guess what? you're gonna have very little empathy. That doesn't mean you were born a sociopath. It means that that area was never exercised, just like building biceps. That area was never provided the adequate stimulation. Same thing with problem solving. A lot of these kids, they completely unravel. They don't know how to problem solve because they were given the same problem solving opportunities as a three-year-old when they're 15. So guess what? Yeah, they do solve problems like a three-year-old because that's exactly what their brain has been exposed to. The brain becomes what it has been exposed to, for good or for bad. Um, yeah, I think I know that. So neural templates. The brain doesn't remember every single little thing. That would be insane. You don't have to remember to push the gas pedal a certain way when you're driving. It just becomes autopilot. You, your brain develops a template for driving, right? When you're first learning, you do need to remember. Don't push it too hard. Don't push the brake too hard. Remember to do your turn signal. We have a template for those sorts of things. The same thing happens with everything that we do, with social interactions, with um, problem solving, with uh, responding to certain stimuli. So, if a brain has grown up exposed to and becomes what it has been exposed to, where adults are unpredictable, adults are unsafe, father's an alcoholic, sometimes he's nice, sometimes he beats mom up, sometimes he beats you up, sometimes he sexually abuses your sister, Sometimes he's the most loving guy in the world. Sometimes he's a happy drunk. Sometimes he's an angry drunk. This is just one example. The neural template of what a safe, or, or what an adult male is, becomes through that lens. So guess what? You, you come to school and you have a male teacher, and that male teacher, the class is a little bit rowdy, and he's an abusive, he's not an alcoholic, but guess what? He has to raise his voice a little bit. Class, class, sit down, sit down. I need you to sit down. Guess what? 
that adult male raising his voice, completely appropriate, nothing wrong with that, triggered his pre-existing neural template of an adult male raising his voice means life and death, right? So that's an extreme example, but think of many other examples like that, okay? With trust, with fear, with, with loneliness, with unpredictability, okay? So the brain develops and is most susceptible to the effects of trauma from conception, I didn't say birth, conception to age five. So if we're shaped by the environment, we're shaped when we first have an environment. The first environment is the uterus. So from age zero to five, the brain is the most spongy. Um, and we all know this, like my example earlier from learning language. Um, it's much easier to learn language as, uh, as you're developing from zero to five versus after maybe like nine or 10, 11 and 12. My goodness, it's possible, but it's extreme. I mean, it's exponentially more difficult. So we learn thousands of words by the time we're five. We learn how to toilet train, we learn how to walk and talk, we learn how to navigate social relationships, we learn uh, many different languages. Um, our brain learns uh, sleep regulation, stuff that's completely unconscious and beyond our control. Our brain learns our metabolism and all, all these different things that the brain is taking in about what the world is. We're learning this. Guess what, those are all normal things. The brain is spongy to all those things because it has to learn very quickly, right? So think about how much we're learning from zero to five of normal things. The brain is just as spongy to bad things. So this is where the argument of they're too young to understand goes out the window. It's not about understanding. Trauma isn't psychological, remember? Trauma is not about an understanding. Having certain thoughts and cognitions can exacerbate your trauma. Sure, that's where you know some sort of cognitive um, uh, therapy is helpful in helping you shift your perception. But that's just addressing the symptom. That's not addressing the real trauma. So it's not about understanding. It's not about a conscious awareness. It's about what it does to the nervous system. So if the nervous system is super spongy from conception to five, it's taking in all of this information. And remember, the brain becomes what it has been exposed to. So if it's been exposed to just terror and violence and lack of love, lack of attunement, um, unpredictability, the brain is gonna view the world through that lens. And it doesn't mean forever, it just means that there's the, the brain is plastic throughout the lifespan. It just becomes less and less and less and less and less spongy, okay? Brain develops from the bottom up, and we'll see what that means. Okay, oh, here we go. So this is a representation of a brain. Obviously you guys know brains aren't triangles. Here's a better one, but we'll talk about this one first. So the bottom pink part is the brainstem, okay? This develops first, this develops uh, in utero, okay? This is about uh, basic functioning, pupil dilation, muscle tension, heart rate, breathing, fight or flight response, uh, your sleep and wake cycles, very, very basic type things, okay? Your perception of safety. Then as you move up, there's more and more, uh, this is more kind of about emotion and emotional regulation and uh, how you view relationships, your sense of trust, your sense of belonging, those feelings of, oh, I feel happy when I'm with this person, or um, man, that person pisses me off. It's, this is more about social things. And then up at the top is, this is your cortex. This is your more kind of logical brain, being able to stop thinking that, being able to reason, being able to remember your math facts, being able to remember geography, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So what it means when it says the brain develops from the bottom up, it means that this area develops first, and then these areas continue to develop throughout the lifespan. So if you have trauma and stress from in utero to zero to five, this area is the most spongy then, and this area is about your regulation. It's about your core regulation, your fight or flight, your, your perception of safety, your body's perception of safety, your, your heart rate, your digestion, all those things. This area gets completely thrown out of whack, okay? And here's the part where it all comes together. See these kind of pathways? You don't need to know what they are, but they're dopamine, norepinephrine, and serotonin, okay? So it's almost kind of like a highway, like a cross-country highway, or like a circuit board, however, whatever analogy you want to use. Higher functioning depends upon lower functioning. If this part is not functioning well, if it's dysregulated, if it's out of whack, guess what? This area is gonna be out of whack. If this and this area is out of whack, you're not gonna be able to think clearly. 
Okay, so, and that isn't just an all or nothing type of thing. There's instances where someone who's been tremendously traumatized, when you regulate them and, and control their heart rate and they feel safe and they feel um, in a good environment, they feel safe with somebody, then they can be more kind of socially appropriate and then they can be more kind of, um, uh, their ability to learn is much better. Okay, but then the smallest little stressor, um, like I said earlier, you know, the teacher raises his voice, boom, he goes from all the way back down to square one, he starts acting like a two-year-old, he's crawling around, he's throwing a tantrum, he can't be reasoned with. He's not being stubborn, he literally can't be reasoned with, because when this is out of whack, look on an fMRI, this area shuts down. You cannot think and act if you are not regulated. You cannot understand the consequences if you're not regulated. So it's about what what is really driving their behavior? Okay, so this is kind of the same thing. Um, so basically this lower area down here, do I feel safe, fed, comfortable, well rested? Not consciously, this isn't uh, a conscious appraisal, this is kind of uh, giving this lower area um, a personality, but it doesn't have a personality. Okay, so if I feel this, this is more kind of your emotional state, and then this is more your learning. So this depends on this, and this depends on this. So the effects of trauma. We have to understand the purpose of their behavior. If you don't understand the purpose of their behavior and only focus on trying to stop the behavior, you're going to have very little results. We have to focus on why they're acting in such a way instead of trying to control what they're doing. So their behaviors are actually, they're a stress response, okay? Their behaviors are their body's way of trying to come back to equilibrium trying to survive. Of course, most of those ways are completely socially inappropriate and dangerous for them, it, it, not beneficial for them, they're not learning, they're getting in trouble, they don't have any friends, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, their behaviors are not okay, they're completely um, inappropriate, but for their brain, they make perfect sense because when they were traumatized, that unseen enemy, tuning out was beneficial when they were being horribly abused. To tune out and to kind of like dissociate is the only thing that kept them from feeling like they were gonna die. Uh, being aggressive uh, when they had to protect mom was extremely beneficial. Or having to run out of the house when dad's a drunk and go hide. That fight or flight, their, their nervous system saying, move, 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 is not ADHD. That is, they're completely uh, aroused, right? Their, their nervous system is saying, Danger, 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 to quote Steve Irwin. Um, oppositionality, all, all of these behaviors are traits that be, are, are states that became traits. So, almost all behavioral impairments. So that's why I say almost all. I mean, if you're born with a developmental disability or on the autism spectrum or mental retardation, um, that doesn't necessarily mean trauma. So, please know that's not what I'm speaking to. But, as a caveat, I've had clients who presented on the spectrum that, or presented as mental retarded, mentally retarded and, or developmentally disabled, and they weren't. It was actually trauma. They were so traumatized that their brain was functioning so poorly that it looked like that. And when, through a lot of therapy and, uh, and healing, when their brain was regulated, they didn't have those symptoms anymore. So it's a huge distinction. It's, it's a very hard, very hard distinction to make. So, I'm sure you guys have heard of fight or flight. There's two more. So fight, what could that look like? Anger, obviously, aggression. It could look like defiance. It could look for, like need for control. They need to win everything. They need to cheat. They need to steal. They need to lie. Flight, hyperactivity, impulsivity, sensory seeking. Can't sit still. Freeze, this is dissociate, just completely zone out. Um, they're ignoring, they got their head down. They have to listen to music in class. Um, they just they just can't focus. This is the brain saying too much, too much. I don't feel safe. We need to do X, Y, Z, which can be all sorts of these things. Um, fold. This is just numb. Give up. Um, this is cutting behavior. This is suicide. This is just completely. Um, I'm done. I give up. And these things aren't conscious things. These are the brain saying, "All right, I'm in charge. I'm in charge. I'm in control." This is completely beyond their conscious uh, cognition. Okay. So let's look at attachment a little bit. Um, attachment trauma is by far the worst thing that can happen. Of course, if you are abused by a stranger or if you're in a horrible, horrific natural disaster or something like that, those things are traumatic. But if you're surrounded by loving, nurturing people, you will heal better than 
compared to if you don't have horrible, horrible things happen to you, but if you have kind of moderately bad things happen and your attachment relationships are terrible, that's worse than the first example. So attachments are extremely important. Relationships, relationships, relationships um, is the key to healing and relationships are the key to understanding why kids act the way they do. And almost all of the, the, the clients I've ever had, and I'm sure most of them that you work with, um, most of the parents have their own issues. You know, and that's not to blame the parents, but it's like, oh my gosh, now I understand you know, why you're struggling. So almost every, every, desire, every undesirable behavior is a cry for an unmet need, and almost every single time that unmet need is connection. Okay, so this explains why they can focus so well when they're one-on-one -on -one with a behavioral aid, assuming that behavioral aid has a good relationship with them, or with a tutor, they can learn when they're with a tutor. Guess what, they're co-regulated. They feel safe with this person, they feel loved by this person, they feel, this person is like something they've never experienced before. It's not that, oh, they're more motivated because it's one-on-one, -on -one. that's part of it but it's because they feel safe. When they feel safe, they can learn. When they feel safe, they can regulate their emotions. So you go over all these things, practice all these things, send them out in the real world, they can't practice the things that you practice. Why, because they're not trying hard enough? Why, because they're defiant? No, because they're not regulated. When they're with you, they're regulated. Okay, so I'm gonna run through these. This is kind of the, the attachment lens. Um, attention seeking, just cut out the word attention, it's connection seeking. You got your class clown, you got your uh, pain in the butt, whether it's seeking good attention or bad attention. This is in your own children too. Um, they're seeking social engagement. They're seeking um, relational reward. They're seeking um, connection because they're feeling dysregulated, right? Class clown. This person isn't just looking for approval, this person is scanning for safety. If, if all eyes are on me, if I'm making them laugh, I feel safe with them. Um, sibling rivalry, almost always about insecure attachment. This is kind of a normal thing. I mean, this isn't all like, oh, you're a bad parent. I mean, my kids have that sibling rivalry. It just means when they when they're, uh, have a rivalry, that means I need to take a step back and say, okay, what am I not doing in my attachment relationship? I need to come closer and figure this out. But it's hard. Um, impulsivity, hyperactivity, distractibility, that is kind of the fight or flight thing. But it's, all, it's a lack of co-regulation. It's a lack of um, feeling regulated, especially in their attachment relationship. Um, I can't tell you how many uh, uh, children that could not regulate their, their, um, their need for hyperactivity and impulsivity and distractibility. When the, um, when the prescription, not literal prescription, but when my recommendation was, I want you to spend more time with your child. I just want you to go to the park and spend time with them. I want you to get off your damn phone and spend time with them. Guess what, the next day in school, significant decrease. It's about feeling connected to someone, kind of co-regulates and gets all those positive hormones going and kind of mitigates those factors of, um, of dysregulation. Um, defiance, testing for protection. Um, I don't care because I don't feel cared for. This is a huge one. This one is always true. Uh, you're gonna get suspended, don't you know that? I don't care. You're gonna fail, you're gonna, why are you joining a gang? You're just gonna kill. I don't care, I don't care, I don't care, I don't care. When they say I don't care, what it means is I don't feel cared for. Maybe not globally, but in that moment. In that moment, they're not feeling connected to. Um, you know, I can go over all these, uh, but you guys will get the slides. Oh, aggression, this one's a big one. A lot of times, unprovoked aggression is a need for touch and physical affection. So, you want to, instruct the parents to touch them appropriately. Some children are touch reactive, especially on the spectrum. Um, but uh, try to find ways of safe and appropriate physical affection. High fives. Uh, you guys have all seen on Facebook, the teacher has the different special handshakes before going mm -hmm. to the classroom. So appropriate physical affection will really be a preventative factor for reducing aggression. Um, peers and gangs are more important than parents. When parents don't have any more control, it's always about that they don't have an attachment with their child or they don't have a secure attachment. And that's not always the parent's fault. You know, they're working, you know, the kid's latchkey, and they have filled that void. Uh, cutting a self-harm, this one's interesting. Um, we've been on this for hours. Um, cutting a self-harm is usually emotional pain from the opposite sex parent. That's a really, really interesting one. People always ask about that. Don't have time. <laughs> <laughs> this is, it, it's anecdotal, by the way, but it's a very strong correlation. I haven't published a research paper, but my supervisor and all of his other supervisees 
dozens and dozens of cases where you target the opposite sex parent and focus on repairing that relationship, even if they're gone or they're dead or they're abandoned from birth, have the parent go through photo albums. Your dad loved you. You know, I know your dad wasn't, uh, you know, he made some bad choices, but you should have seen him when he held you when you were a baby. He really cared about you. Stuff like that. Or if they are around to, Dad, I need your help. <coughs> the cutting goes away. <coughs> okay, regulation thermometer. This is something that I made. I think it's kind of helpful in understanding a child's level of arousal. So numbers one through 10, obviously we don't, these are arbitrary, but it's kind of helps to understand, okay? So this isn't just for a traumatized child, this is for all of us, or you know, high, moderate, low, or you know, relatively untraumatized. This applies for everybody, okay? So state-dependent functioning means our ability to function depends upon what stage we're in, and when we stress, we regress to a lower stage. And this, I'll, I'll give you guys some examples of myself. So right now, everybody probably walks around at a three or a four, right? Um, you know, maybe when you uh, have paperwork or something to do, you're maybe you have a five or a six because you're a little bit stressed out, right? Totally normal, it's not trauma, it's just, you know, stress. When you're up here, you're, you can be a little bit more irritable. You can maybe be a little bit more zoned out or distracted or a little bit more argumentative or sensory seeking. Well, we'll talk about sensory soon. You know, you can't sit still. Um, and then let's say you have another stressor, you're stuck in traffic or you get pulled over by the police or your spouse is being, um, your spouse is stressed out when you get home and they're being kind of a butthead. Now you move up kind of into seven or, seven or eight and you're very oppositional or you can't sit still um, or you're unreasonable, you're just very firm and you're arguing and saying things you don't mean, right? Or you're checked out, you're just on your phone, leave me the hell alone, right? People have different coping styles in different situations, you know? So a lot of these things are polar opposites whether they be distracted or hyperactive or angry or aggressive, that's all fight, flight, freeze, and fold, right? People can kind of go through anything depending on, um, on what, what their coping style is, okay? And then if you go to the next level, this is completely blackout rage. This is try to flee or you're completely spaced out, you're rocking back and forth. This is very rare that this happens. So what does this have to do with a traumatized nervous system? Most of us probably walk around with three or four. Most traumatized kids or stressed out kids or kids or adults that have had a lot of stress, their, their thermostat, their smoke detector is probably at about a six or a seven. That's their baseline, right? So they're, that's normal to them. So you ask them, do you feel stressed out? Do you feel angry? No, you know, because that's, that's just becomes habitual. They're habituated, that's normal to them. So the smallest little stressor, okay, take out your uh, pen and paper, it's time for a test or um, someone accidentally bumps them, or someone cuts in line. First of all, they have a distorted template of what's safe or not, so that person bumping them is more of a perceived threat. But even just uh, take out your pencil, pencil and paper, oh, I don't have a pencil, my pencil's broken, right? Those are little things that are very inconsequential, but they're the straw that broke the camel's back, okay? So it's not that these kids we work with go from zero to 100 like this, they're not going from zero to 100, or they're not going from zero to 10. They're going from seven to nine, they're going from seven to 10, because they're walking around at seven. So the key isn't to help them control themselves when they're at an eight or a nine. The key is to get their baseline down to a three or four by helping them feel safe and regular. Okay, so the intimacy barrier. So there's an area in our brain for social engagement, for feeling connected to other people, okay? So when that's online, when we feel safe, like my example of a tutor or a one-on-one -on -one aide, we're compliant, we're flexible, we're reasonable, we're able to learn from our mistakes. But when protect is activated, whether it be a distorted template or an actual legitimate threat, or just the straw that broke the camel's back, a bunch of small accumulated stressors that are normal everyday life that most of us can cope with, it switches over, you can't, it, it's a toggle switch, it's all or nothing, it can't, you can't be in halfway connect, halfway and protect. Once that connect is tripped, then you're more rigid, concrete, oppositional in your social relationships, right? So the key isn't to try to control them in this, the key is to flip the switch back over to social engagement. They need to feel safe, they need to feel understood. Okay? So here's the order of interacting with children. First, regulate, relate, reason. And I'll, I have examples of all of these. Okay. Regulate, 
Sensory activities. Okay, you guys have all seen the fidget spinners, right? <laughs> Sensory regulating activities. We all do this. Um, I told Paul earlier, um, I might be pacing back and forth. I'm intentionally chewing gum because gum is regulating. Um, the lower areas of the brain, you remember the upside down triangle? The very bottom fight or flight areas are, they're regulated through sensory activities, right? Um, that can be fidgeting, that can be pacing back and forth, that can be going for a walk, that can be chewing gum, uh, and an extreme case would be rocking back and forth, or um, children on the autism spectrum. Their sensory input is so intense that they need to do stimming behaviors, which is um, uh, repetitive, uh, rhythmic um, sensory input to, to quiet down those dysregulated areas of the brain. Okay, so music, singing, drumming, uh, the kids at beach, they always need to listen to music. Um, and usually it's more kind of rhythmic, um, you know, rap music, and it really helps them calm down. They throw a temper tantrum when their teacher makes them take out their one earbud. Why, you know, I need it to feel calm. If I don't have my music, I don't feel calm. Um, last week I had a parent um, who got her uh, child uh, a fidget spinner, and he's incredibly ADHD-like symptoms. He can't sit still. For the first time in his whole life, he's a second grader, he had all greens that week. The principal banned the fidget spinners. Next week, fell off the cliff. Was it the fidget spinner? Probably had something to do with it, but I mean, I'm not saying these things are magical, but they are incredibly important. So regulate means if a child's having a hard time, don't make them sit still. Give them some Play-Doh, give them something to fidget with. Go on a walk. If you need to talk about a difficult subject, like you're getting in trouble, or we're gonna call your parent or whatever, go for a walk with them. Assuming they're not the, the kids that bolt, you know? I mean, you have to understand what's appropriate. But um, playing catch, roll a ball back with and forth. Lots of occupational therapy uh, ideas. So, these things are so, so, so important. So regulate is sensory things, but it's also safety. They have to feel safe with you, okay? Which moves into the next one, relate. Um, your ability to relate to someone. So if, give them some sensory activities, um, and sometimes I approach these dysregulated ch children like, like a cornered stray dog, you know? Height is power, your facial expression. Remember I said your template for, um, a traumatized template is very, um, misconstruing of uh, sensory input. So a scowl or a frown can be completely misread as a threat as an alcoholic father. Smile, have caring, warm eyes when you see them. Um, maintain your distance if they're dysregulated. Don't go up and try to touch them. This is a, a cornered straight dog. Height is power, sometimes with the smaller ones. You know, I just, you know, hey. Don't use too many words. Words are language. Language is the upper area of the brain. Remember the upside down triangle? Language is up there. It ain't working. Trying to reason with them, trying to talk them through it is not gonna work. Just be very simple. Hey, you know, I'm here, I'm here, you know. So connect with their inner child. Um, so let's say they're feeling a little bit safe and they're feeling able to relate to you. They trust you. They're kind of calming down. Um, this is when you can kind of uh, start listening to them, empathize with them, validating with them, reflecting, showing them that you understand, that you get them. So their upper areas of the brain are kind of starting to come online. You know, their middle areas of the brain are starting to come online. See? This is still the same triangle. Still the upside down brain. Okay. Relate is so important. I have like three or four slides just for relate. You guys know what oxytocin. This is what stimulates uh, labor and delivery the love and bonding hormone. Uh, it helps calm, soothe, and regulate a triggered nervous system. So it's so, so, so important to provide these children with feelings of caring, feelings of love. It seems kind of hippie and weird, but it's actual neuroscience. It, it's about feeling safe, about feeling cared for. Literally quiets down that brain to be receptive to learning and understanding, hey, maybe I shouldn't be doing this. Dopamine, this is relational reward and motivation neurochemical. I could get into the neuroscience of of motivation and dopamine, but we don't really have the time. You got kids that refuse to do it, kids that refuse to, I don't care, kids that uh, just would rather be on social media than, um, than what they should be doing. It's a lack of dopamine, they need to feel cared for. When they feel cared for, then uh, that can set the dopamine in motion. 
Cortisol, this is the opposite. Cortisol is a stress hormone during perceived stress. So when you have cortisol surging through you, it's just perpetuating that poorly functioning stress response system. Mirror neurons. There are neurons in our brain that actually fire when you observe someone else doing something. This is when you see someone with bugs crawling on them on TV, you literally feel bugs crawling on you. Or when you're on TV, or you see someone on TV and you hear that dentist drill, you can literally kind of feel that tightness in your jaw. Um, or why we cry at sad movies. We, there are neurons in our brain devoted to being able to feel what other people are feeling. And this is for the good and the bad. If you're dysregulated and pissed off, and I, oh, this kid drives me nuts, not this kid again, but you're sitting there, you know, really trying to smile and really trying to pull it together, his mirror neurons are seeing past that facade, and his mirror neurons are getting actually more dysregulated because he's feeling your dysregulation. But conversely, if you're genuinely regulated in the presence of dysregulation, you're co-regulating him or her. Um, more about oxytocin and dopamine. So yeah, uh, oxytocin and dopamine are released during loving, patient, caring interactions. Cortisol is released when we're being punitive or overpowering or, um, or, or frightening. So the question to ask yourself is, is my intervention or interaction with this child going to produce cortisol or dopamine? I mean cortisol or oxytocin, I'm sorry. Then dopamine too. Okay, now you're able to reason, okay? So remember, regulate, relate, reason. So let's assume you've provided them with sensory activities, they feel safe, your relationship with, is good, they feel understood, they feel valued by you, you're doing some really caring things that's producing uh, oxytocin and decreasing cortisol, they're kind of starting to come around. Now and only now is the time when you can do collaborative problem solving. Gee, when, when you did this, this happened. What do you think would be better to do next time? You know, of course these things are important. Empathy building, perspective thinking. Look, when you hit Billy uh, because he cut, cut in line, how do you think he felt? You know, do you think he did that on purpose? You know, these things are really important too. Verbal processing. Tell me about it. Tell me what's going on. Tell me about um, you know, your perspective of it. And then cognitive restructuring too, which is a, a therapeutic term, which is um, helping someone, you know, if they're saying, well, everybody's against me, or um, you know, it's only because of this and this and this, and you know that's not true, it's kind of helping them see the other side so they don't perceive it so badly. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of cognitive restructuring. Is it really true that nobody likes you? You know, I saw that you know, this and this and this person. Well, yeah, I do have friends. I guess you're right. You know? um, that's basically it. Regulate, relate, reason. I believe this is the last slide. I went extremely fast. This is probably a four to six hour training that I condensed. I have lots of video clips and stuff to give examples, but I wanted to leave about 15, 20 minutes um, to answer questions and to give my own case vignettes or to answer questions about your case vignettes. Um, please have at it. Yes, go for it. Um, so I'm currently working with a student who's in a foster child. Okay. Has home therapy. Would you recommend, because they were asking for like school-based therapy as well, mm -hmm. two different like home therapy, plus school therapy? A, a different therapist? Yeah. No, too many cooks in the kitchen. I mean, okay. in, unless they were from the same agency, like FSP or something, where there, it's a collaborative team. Right. Um, but to have home and school-based therapy, yes, but not through different, different people. people. Right. No. Um, Oh, this, um, as you were talking about this one, I'm specifically thinking, with one student, uh, thinking of one student right now, a high schooler, and a lot of things going on in his life right now. I think poverty is something to do with it, and uh, no home right now. He doesn't have his mom anymore right, right. now because he's with an auntie while mom with a friend because he just don't, cannot afford a place. And lately, he's pretty much given up. Well, we used to have a relationship, him and I, where at least he was showing respect, and now just completely, right. you know, and so, what do you suggest in that situation? Of course, with me, I'm, you know, I'm trying to help him, and right. we might be only having for another month, that's about it, they might move right. to another stage, but I don't want to give up in that one last month. Right, so you're saying um, the, the, the sudden apathy of giving up has kind of coincided with the loss of his mom? Well, he always had that immaturity. Right. He's a 17 year old, sure. but he's always been lacking motivation to do mm. really well at school. So that's always been there all this time, but recently just the, the respectful, the, just the, the, 
the lack of wanting to relate to, mm -hmm. to us adults. Yeah, but it's, you're saying there was it's, it's, it's kind of always been that way, but recently it it's kind of crossed worse. a new level, yes. right? And coinciding with crossing a new, new level was something happened with mom. Mom's now mom's well, out the of picture. Situation. The mom's home. still there, but they just don't live under the same roof. Anymore. Okay, yeah, it's, it's related to that. Remember, mm -hmm. I don't care means I don't feel cared for. He does say I don't care a lot. Yeah, he doesn't <laughs> feel cared for. So yeah. it's wonderful that you're someone that cares for him. Um, he needs a therapeutic team or volunteer team to help him feel more cared for. Um, that's talking to mom to do the best she can to spend more time with him. Um, working with uh, the courts to, if she's a safe person, to get them more visitation. Um, if that's not possible, uh, extended family, a faith community, um, volunteers, big brothers, as many safe, loving, caring adults to surround him as possible to get um, just many, many, many doses of feeling cared for. But ultimately, it has to come from mom. Uh, mom is, I mean, they are together, like, they, it's not like there's no legal issue going on, it's just right. like a home situation. Right. But what I would like to know as a person, as a behavior is, um, what can I do at this moment? We are looking into getting him um, mental health service through the school mm -hmm. right now, the school psychologist is in that process. But those things take a while. Mm -hmm. And again, there's a chance of me only having like literally a month with him until the end right. of the school year. At this moment, the way I approach him, when right now when I approach him, I'd be like, hey, so so, you know, mm -hmm. I'm here, how are you doing? And he's gonna like, meh. Mm -hmm. That's what he does. Okay. What do you suggest for me to do at this moment? What is that, your goal to get him to do schoolwork? Um, well, that was the goal, but right now just to... Get him to connect at all? Yes. Okay. <laughs> I've, gone, um, I've lowered my expectation to okay. that right now. Um, something that works really good in that situation is empowerment. Mm -hmm. um, find out what he likes and have him teach you about it, whether it be music, whether it be uh, his passions. Um, maybe bring forth some things that you like to do. Maybe he likes to... Um, or Legos, or cooking, or something. Something that you guys could do together. Make a simple meal together. Um, and the same thing with his teacher. Have his teacher empower him. Have him be a helper. Uh, hey, can you come with me? Can you come carry something in my car or something? I, I care about you. I value you. you. I need your help. You are such an important person, and I need you to help me. That can, empowerment can really help a child that feels so out of control. The loss of his mom, his foster placements, whatever other traumas he had, he had no power over those things. He had no control over those things. That was just the world overpowering him with a bunch of pain and pain and pain and fear. So the opposite of being overpowered is being empowered. So empower him. Uh, give him a thing. Obviously, not against his will. It has to be find things that he wants to do, that he um, would be motivated to do. And it might have nothing to do with school. It might just be listening to music, it might just, but, but share it with him and, and have his teacher do that too. I mean, it's not going to be a magic cure-all, but it's, it's a step in the right direction. So definitely, it sounds to me from your information, it's like we do that, we reach out, but at the same time, we're not going to like force it on them. No, 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 We're going to wait until they see, figure out, for them right. to come to our site. Yeah, you, there, will, there will be something that he will want to do. Okay. You're going to just have to throw out lots and lots of things, and he's going to be like, you know, he's not going to want to do that. You'll find something that he's interested in, and then he teaches you, not you teach him. Thank you. I have a student who we had for a year and a half and is now um, going to be with us another year of pre-K. So he just turned five, four in February. Um, exposed to drugs in Hero, separated from mom. Grandma got custody when he was a month old. Um, grandma shared with us he wouldn't let her hold him. Um, I mean, as you're talking, I'm just like, this is him, this is so much of him, and we've been approaching him from an ABA standpoint, because mm -hmm. that's what we do. <laughs> um, and um, I've got to the point with our different interventions where we're, we're at trial and error phase, mm -hmm. we're just trying everything we can. It seems like cognitively, and I don't know if this is actual drug exposure in utero, I don't know how much of our trying to reason with you, even when we bring it down to, we're doing visuals, we're gonna do immediate, you know, responses to your behavior so that you can make associations nope. It None of it's working, and I feel yeah. like you're- This is literally not, those errors are literally not online, because right. it's not regulated. Even when I bring it down to a no, simple, no, simple, simple no, level, no. Uh -uh. Because he's not emotionally, and he has an attachment with the teacher. Sure. I can put the most experienced, amazing therapist with him. Mm -hmm. He will aggress, he will 
if a student walks past him, if another person walks past him and is within arm's reach, he will grip for their hair and grab it, mm -hmm. unprovoked, like unprovoked, you said. Right. But if the classroom teacher is his one-on-one -on -one for the day, he won't touch it. Because he feels regulated. It's all about safety. It's not about helping him understand his behaviors. It's not about helping him understand that those things aren't right. But that's, right. that's, that's the top area of the brain. That, you're not even there yet, right? right. I mean, and so, you so don't wax your part before you wash it. Right. And grandma won't do child then because her, she has about five grandchildren now who her <laughs> daughter's bad choices have affected. Right. So grandma's dysregulated. Grandma's dysregulated. Right. Grandma's been sober for X number of years. Grandma's yeah. doing better, but grandma will not go get She's got a lot on her plate. Right. But she also is not going to get help. Okay. So we're, we um, it, I, I advise you all to read the book, uh, The Boy Who Was Raised as a Dog. Um, by Bruce Perry. Uh, it's, it's an easy read. It's an incredibly powerful and emotional read. It, it's interesting. It's a page turner. It is not academic. I mean, there's academic stuff in there, but it's, it's told through case vignettes, so you will absolutely love it. It will change your life. And um, my response, my answer to your question is directly from that book. So if there was he couldn't be held. He, he couldn't be held. He couldn't be touched. Right. Probably because of the drug exposure, but also probably a bunch of early trauma too. Right. If his mom's on drugs, when did Grandma get him? At a few months old. One month. One month. Okay. So for this first month, he's probably just sitting there in a crib, screaming, right. malnourished, uh, soiled diapers. I mean, horrible, horrible stuff, right? So his neural template of what human contact is is unsafe. Maybe, maybe sitting there screaming, and mom, shut up, shut up, shut up. Who knows? I mean, I'm speculating. So anyway, the, the things that are supposed to happen to build in a healthy nervous system, a healthy regulation, what, like I said, um, it's not just when bad things happen, but when good things don't happen. In his case, bad things happened, but also good things didn't happen. What is a baby supposed to experience? Rocking, rhythmic. A uh, baby's supposed to experience eye-to-eye -eye gaze, smiling, cooing, baby talk, right? If those things aren't happening, then your nervous system isn't building in regulation, which is rhythmic, right? Or even in utero, the first rhythm we hear is nine months of the parent's heart rate. If mom's on drugs, it's up and down. It's up and down. And her placenta is getting all sorts of drugs and all sorts of stress hormone. People on drugs aren't stress-free. They're tremendously stressed. That's why they're using drugs. So anyway, to the intervention, this kid needs basic things that didn't happen. We need to find a way for him to have safe touch. That may be through therapeutic massage. There's special occupational therapists that specialize in therapeutic massage. And it would probably, be, it would obviously have to be in a way that he can tolerate. You don't strap him down and touch him, you know? Mm -hmm. it's, it's very, they, I mean, I'm not a therapeutic masseuse, but they specialize in that, in finding ways to touch children who have had early, early trauma. And then after that, get them in a music and movement class, get them in a, a dance class, or maybe, uh, children's yoga, or get him a porch swing or a rocking chair to rock back and forth. He never, his brain never had rhythm. It never had rocking. Or maybe it did from grandma, but from conception to age one month, you're already behind the eight ball. So he needs very basic stuff. I bet you if you got him a yoga ball or something, or... Um, he loves the OT swing. Yeah, that's a swing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Get him a swing. He will also... Um, narrate his day and like rehearse his schedule and rehearse what's going to happen and it almost seems i mean it's this kid that you look at and you almost want to say he's ID and all of our strategies don't work mm -hmm. and then his language is like he knows who's in the room he's hyper vigilant right who walked in who walked out that yep. door open what's yep. happening and it's yep. that because like, like, i need to make sure i'm yeah, safe exactly so he needs to be regulated. Give him a swing in the classroom or something, or get him on a swing, get him on doses of a swing. Every 10 minutes he gets to go out of the classroom and swing for five, you know? If he's dysregulated the whole time anyway, he's not learning. He's been retained twice, right? So I'd rather him have 10% of the total 100% of instruction rather than 0%. He's in the classroom 100% of the time, but he's not learning anything. I'd rather be out of the classroom 90% of the time, but when he's here, he's at least getting 10% of the learning. You know, right. obviously that's an extreme. You want it closer to, you know, the other way around. But he needs touch and he needs rhythm. He needs back and forth motion and touch. Those two things. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, I'm at uh, school size, probably about 50% of the 
Um, definitely school-based mental health services, and I would say 50% um, is gross, gross, grossly low. I would say 90. Well, I mean, I would say 90. Clearly, showing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, but anyway, um, yeah, uh, school-based mental health, and that's this is my passion. I'm transitioning from a clinician to doing this because this isn't. I mean, the neuroscience is extremely complicated, but you don't have to understand the complexity of it. You just have to understand the concept of it and the fundamentals of it. And you guys can all do anything that I can do. You don't have to be a therapist to be therapeutic. You just have to kind of understand the concepts. Any teacher can do this. Any custodian can do this, you know? We have to have the cooperation and the understanding of the right. teachers. Right, that's the hardest part. Yeah. Are there any programs out there that can help facilitate the training? That's, that's what I'm doing. This is the first one. I'm just starting at Beach. <laughs> yeah, my, um, my vision is, is to, next year I'm going to be at Beach and then Poly Pal, um, so that'll be two schools, but my vision is in the next few years to actually be a program manager and have lots of people like me doing what I'm doing through all of Long Beach Unified, uh, Head Start, um, elementary, middle, and high school. I, I mean, I think this is, it's, it's long overdue. This whole trauma-informed thing started in the 90s, and it's just now catching on like, oh wow, no I did this. Anybody else? Yeah. I just think the information is helpful because sometimes, even though you know, I mean, we are professionals, but sometimes you know, it does creep in your head and it's like, oh, you're just being difficult, or you're just being unmotivated. It's mm -hmm. going, you know, I just that that just kind of blaming the yeah. student. This Absolutely. is kind of again just. I'm seeing the student now every day, just mm -hmm. to kind of tell him, hey, I'm here, yes. even though he hasn't been responding, and get discouraging after two weeks and you don't see any change, right. but just to understand, hey, maybe, yep. you know, it just kind of helps to kind of keep going for, just to go back there again this afternoon and just yep. be, hey, maybe change the way I talk to him, yep. you know, because I can see there's a couple of things I can change even the way I approach him. Right, the first right, thing yeah. I do that 10 seconds. Yeah, yeah. So it's helpful with that one student. Hopefully it's so much less about them. trying to control the behavior and understanding why the behavior is happening in the first mm -hmm. place and addressing those needs, which is usually feeling safe and understood and regulation. I think as a behavior, sometimes that can be well, of course. opposite of what we of usually course. do. The work you guys do is amazing, but <laughs> the times with those challenging cases, yeah. you just need to take a step back and prep the foundation, and then the work that you can do can really take hold, right? Yes, so it's, it gives a level of understanding. Yeah. I'll leave you guys with one. Uh, mm -hmm. That's it. That's, mm -hmm. that's what I would recommend you guys. You guys have to unconditionally love them, and you have to believe that the behavior might be out of their control.